<coughs> One more. Um, Jenun Robert Imneda. Oh. Okay. That, that's, that's as good as it's going to get. Okay. I've only been here for 24 hours. Uh, so I haven't had more time. So I am from uh, Sweden, far, far away. Uh, and I usually, when I travel somewhere, I want to learn about the place that I'm going to and trying to figure out what, what it's like. And uh, so I looked at, at South Korea and Sweden and, and seeing the differences. Um, and if you lived in Sweden, you would have 28.8% more time, uh, more free time. You would have more money. You would use less oil and you would live longer. But if I lived here, I'm, I'm apparently it's, it's hard with jobs in Sweden. So if I moved here, there's a, a lower risk of being unemployed. Uh, I don't have to spend as much money on health care. I use less electricity. And the, the last one, the most important one, I'm less likely to be murdered. <laughs> That's a good thing, uh, what I think. Um, and another thing usually when you travel is trying to, to figure out the local culture and see things that you recognize. And, and I walked around uh, last night when I came here and I found this in the street. Uh, and it's perfect, it's someone I know. I didn't know that you had a local Darth Vader. Uh, it's, uh, you know the people are standing at the, the hotels with the signs and showing people what you <laughs> drive. So it's not Photoshop, he, he looked like that. And I told him I would make him famous. Um, so, um, I am an IT professional, uh, which means that, uh, you know, as everyone, we take whatever things we have and we just make them work, that, that's all we have. So today I'm going to be talking about the, the web in general and the web as a history lesson, but uh, more importantly about progressive web apps as well. So it started uh, way, way back when we only had uh, HTML and HTTP and, and documents. And that's a long time ago now. Um, but it was a good start of just communicating things and, and getting things online. And then we got uh, the common gateway interfaces, just making sure you actually could have proper communications back as well. Um, and then with sort of the, the peak CGI thing, uh, we had only frames, uh, no iframes. Uh, so you would have frames, so you would start building services where you could post forums and, and things like that. And then one of the sort of revolutions, and I don't think we realized that it was a revolution back then, was uh, XML HTTP uh, that Microsoft came up with. So they first had it in, in MS XML and it went into uh, version four of Internet Explorer. Uh, but People didn't really use it that much. Uh, a number of years later, Google started building Gmail of just showing the things that you can do online directly in a web browser and trying to sort of push the boundaries. And then we had in 2005, 2006, the big Ajax hype, uh, which was a, one big part in Ajax was XML HTTP. It's just making it possible to just update parts of a page or having dynamic updates instead of reloading entire pages all the time. Uh, and it was fantastic. And, and one interesting thing about Ajax, and I'll come back to that, is that Ajax is not just one specific technology or one API. It was a combination of, of using JavaScript, the XML HTTP object, uh, JSON if you wanted to, or XML. Uh, but it's just combining different things of making things better. And I think it's important to remember that. Then in 2007, uh, Apple came out with the iPhone, which was a revolution. Uh, all respect to Samsung. Samsung is great too. Uh, but back in 2007, uh, iPhone really sort of changed the landscape of, of well, mobile phones and having proper smartphones and finger gestures and all that. And the interesting thing is we look at it from a web perspective is that they also uh, added support for app cache for having offline, offline support. They were having add to home screen. They're starting to doing proper transforms and transitions, device pixel ratios, supporting web SQL as well. And, and I think, I mean, for a year, uh, as you know, uh, the idea with the iPhone was that you would build web apps or web pages on that phone. 
then a year went by and they introduced Objective-C and the App Store and all that. And, and I guess you would say financially it went okay for them. Uh, but I think it's also too bad that it sort of missed out on, on taking the web further. Maybe the web wasn't ready back then, but we maybe could have pushed it harder. So for a long, long time, um, for about six years, give or take, uh, mobile just meant apps. Like, and, and I still have that, like if I talk to people about uh, the web, they see the web as desktop. They don't necessarily connect the web with being on mobile phones as well. They just see it as one big web browser and, and screens and all that. So we started to see how we can make things um, better, especially with the offline story since AppCache had uh, a few issues. So what we started working with was the, the service worker and just making sure that you would have a proper network proxy. You can handle things offline, but you can also have a really powerful object to do many, many more things. Um, and I'll get back to that. And it's going to be interesting to see um, this year um, and, and going forward the inventions we're doing with different new technologies that you combine to make sure that the, the web becomes better. And back in 2010, Wired Magazine declared that the web was uh, dead, that it was over, we had a good time and, and time to move on, it was only native apps. Uh, then about a week ago, they published a new article. It turns out the web isn't dead. Uh, it, it's never happened before in journalism that they've been wrong, but this was the first time. And the interesting thing, of course, with reading this article as well, is just seeing that the web is, is um, all the time consistently becoming more powerful on mobile as well. And, and it, it's uh, the work that we're trying to do and a number of other companies trying to do as well to make sure that the web can be uh, as powerful on, on mobile as well as it has been on desktop. And, and also sort of on the notion of talking that the, the web is dead. Back in November last year, Chrome on mobile had 800 million users. That's pretty far from dead, if you ask me. I, I would say if I run a business, I have 800 million users, that's okay. Um, but then about six months went by, um, and now in April, we have 1 billion users on Chrome on mobile. Um, so I think if you sort of compare the, the people saying, no, it's only native and, and the web is dying and all that, Apparently, it's not true, right? Uh, and uh, the mobile web becomes increasingly relevant as well for people. Uh, but I also do want to point out, I mean, we come from Google, work for Google, but the web is so much more than just Chrome. Uh, and it's really important that we together work to make things good on the web platform so it works on, on all different kinds of browsers. Uh, and, and that's one of the most important things with the web. Like, it's the most democratic medium that we have. It's not just one company running the web or just one browser to access the web. You have so many different options, so we need to make sure that it stays that way. And then everyone sort of always asks about native and the web. So actually, wait, let me try something. <coughs> so the important thing is, it's not the web versus native, right? It's not Highlander, it's not a sword fight, it's not a duel. Uh, the web and native will continue to coexist for a long, long time. <clears throat> and, and I think we need to get away from the mindset of that you know, only one can survive. Uh, they're complementing each other and they're good at different things. Sometimes they're good at the same thing. And if we look at uh, numbers, um, if you work at Google, you learn to love numbers really fast because numbers are amazing most of the time. And at looking at web traffic, the, the traffic on web right now, uh, on mobile, is twice as high that, uh, than the traffic that you have in native apps. Um, you know, twice as much. That's a lot of traffic on the mobile web. And what this means, the, the, the conclusion or takeaway from here, is the enormous reach that you have with the web. That you can get things out there to so many different kinds of people uh, in so many different ways. However, uh, and, and, and you know, in a, which I think is fair, you would argue that, well, people seem to use mostly native apps um, on, on their mobiles when you see them. And that seems to be true. Because we're looking at the, the numbers from the other perspective. Like, the time that you spend in your mobile phone or on your mobile phone, that only 10% of that time is being spent on the mobile web, and the other 90% of our time is being spent in native apps. 
But it's not through all native apps within your phone. It's mostly just you know, three, four, five apps that you spend a lot of time in. Uh, usually social apps, messaging, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And the, the takeaway from this, of course, is that with native apps, they, you seem to get a much higher long-term engagement. Uh, people spend a lot of time within your content. And, and this is sort of what I'm talking about with this as well, that combining them, uh, if, if you build things for the web, you have uh, the widest reach by far. But sometimes, depending on what you build, you know, some options with a native app could be good as well because you might get a long-term engagement. So it's figuring out what work works best and how they can, can help each other. I also think, though, that we kind of lost something along the way of making it easy for users because when you need to start giving your users instructions how to use something, you're doing something wrong. That's not a good user experience. You don't want to give them a manual of what to do in scanning QR code and installing things. I mean, as you can see at the bottom here, uh, it says, you want to go to a URL, you want to get that content, and that's it. As easy as possible for users. And I think we need to try and get back to that as well, um, you know, seeing the different install cycles, all that. How, how could it be easier for users? And we have some studies showing as well that for each step that you have in the process for a user, you lose about 20% of the users, uh, every step. So if you have things going from you know, a search or going through an app store to <coughs> installation to all the other steps, you lose more and more users. And, then, and if you're running a business, it's kind of hard to motivate to your manager why you lost 40% of your users because it just made it a bit harder for them to access your actual content or doing what they wanted to do. Um, looking at this, the web is probably somewhere there in the middle. Uh, you might search, you might put in a URL or something, a couple of extra step and then you have the content. So it's, it's good, but it could become even better in that sense. And, and same thing if we're looking of, at performance. Uh, look at the number of bounce rates, the number of users that you lose with just not being fast enough. Uh, it's really, really important. I can't stress enough. Like performance has to be, no matter if it's web or native, it has to be one of the key <coughs> ingredients in what you're building. It has to be an instant experience for the user. And an, an interesting perspective on this as well is looking at performance uh, and, and some of the tests that we've run before has been that if it's consistently fast for the user all the time, of course they're happy. But if it's consistently slow all the time, they think it's okay. They're not happy, but they think it's okay. But the worst thing you can do to a user if it's sometimes fast and sometimes slow, because then they will hate you. Because they don't, they don't know what to expect and, and they will just sit there and you know, shaking their phone or throwing it out. So, so it's really, really important that if you work on performance within your, your apps or web apps, make sure that you have the consistent speed and a consistent flow and user experience there. If we're looking at the, the web things and, and the rail aspect that we're using there, uh, some, some of the few numbers that we have is just making sure that pages on a, on a 3G uh, should load under 10 seconds, which sounds a bit high, but 3G is not very fast either. So it's just finding different steps in here, what you would actually expect there. Um, well, then, of course, you can also talk about perceived speed. So the important thing is that you render something really fast that users see, and then you can laser load things in the background or having different priorities or something like that. But make them see something, make them experience that it's right there for them. And one of the acronyms, because as developers, we don't have enough acronyms, so, so we're going to add one more here. One of the important acronyms here uh, is SLICE. And it's about finding out how we can build instantly engaging sites and apps without the need for a mandatory app download. Because looking back at the steps and adding friction for users is, we're going to get rid of that. <coughs> we, we want people to be able to <coughs> consume content right away. And the first one, the S in SLICE, stands for secure. And basically on the web, it's just making sure that we have all the different domains sandboxed from each other. Um, so basically, you can go as a user to any website and you can feel that you're safe. Uh, another part here, of course, is working with permissions, which is really, really interesting uh, with having users approve things. Like you have the, the geolocation thing of, of the website, for instance, asking you, do you want to share your location or other things like that, and making it 
not scary for the users, but also more of a demand thing. Like, like same thing with installing any app. If, if an app asks for 435 permissions, you're a bit afraid of installing that app. Um, and same thing with a website. Like if you go in and it's just asking for things all the time, it would sort of scare the user away. So it's more of giving the user experience that when you ask for permission is when they understand what you will use it for. So they see a value in it for them. So for instance, if you do a Google search on mobile, it, it right away asks you for your location. And, and it's, to be honest, it's kind of hard to see the value for yourself. Like I could share it. I well. I, I trust Google in that sense. It, it gives me money. Um, but, but it's also, I, I don't really know what they will use it for, right? But if you look at something that, that we have in Android with Google now, uh, most people are more than happy with sharing a number of things in there because they get the extra value out of it. If I, without asking for it, uh, find out where I parked my car or when my flight is, etc., cetera, it, it gives me more value and then I'm fine with sharing. So it's kind of a give and take relationship. You can't just sort of demand things for users without giving them something extra back for it. And the L in Sly stands for linkable. And, and naturally on the web, which I still think is one of the beautiful things about the web, that you can have a link. You can point someone uh, anywhere on the web. Just directly follow this link and, and you get to a certain point. And if you're reading um, blog posts and articles on, on Medium, for instance, one interesting thing that they started doing is that each paragraph in a blog post has a direct link as well. So it's not just that you would send the link to a friend and then sort of, again, giving them instructions where to scroll and where to look and click here, but rather giving them a direct link to the exact piece of content that you want them to see. And indexable, of course. And, and sort of coming back to the, the web and being the, the democratic medium for mankind is making it indexable as well. So no matter if you're a company with a lot of money or if you're just someone working at home building your own thing, it doesn't really matter. Just making sure that all of your content, no matter who you are or no matter <laughs> where you live, is access accessible for anyone. Um, so just making sure that, that anything can be indexed uh, and can be found. And the composable part, the C in Slice, it's, it's both fantastic and, and scary at the same time. But it's just basically when you're building different websites or different web apps, is that you can uh, use JavaScript from a number of different sources or combining things in the form of web components and, and similar approaches. But it's just a thing of being composable in the sense that you can take just a number of different stuff and put it together and, and build whatever you want. So it could be some of your things or it could be, you know, you can be the best developer in the world probably by copying and pasting from Stack Overflow. Or maybe not the best, but the second best. So it's just about um, seeing what's out there and how you can bind them into a better experience. And the last one, uh, which is kind of a, a fancy word, is uh, ephemeral. And with ephemeral, and, and sort of coming back to a URL as well, is that most of the user experiences, it is that you only need that once. Uh, so if I go out here uh, in Seoul to a restaurant uh, and I just I want to look at their menu or, or get some quick information about the restaurant, I probably only want that once, unless it's an amazing restaurant I will be coming back. But, uh, so you want to go to a URL, you're just going to get the content, but without all the extra steps of installing and scanning and approving and all that, just put in the restaurant name and, I'm, and I get all the content. And that's the the idea with ephemeral, that it's, it's temporary. It's just for now, you get some quick content, some quick user experience, and then you're done with that. And we've been having some studies looking at why developers need a native app, because it's important for us trying to make the web better as well. Not killing native, but just making the web uh, better. And asking native developers, why, why, why do you go native? What's, what the extra value for you, what, what does it give you? And the most common things that come up that people talk about is that they want to have really good performance, they want to have offline access, they want to have periodic background processing, notifications of course, um, sensor access and, and OS specific features. Uh, and if you look at performance, of course that varies a lot between different, uh, different <coughs> phones, different operating systems and all that, and then you know, low end, mid end and high end. And uh, being in the land of, of Samsung, Samsung have great high end phones, right? 
uh, but you have the, the entire range for users as well. But I think, I mean, performance is something that's constantly being worked on in, and of course, in iOS and in Android, but also in, in Chrome and all the other different browsers. So that's sort of, you need to make sure that your performance from your <coughs> side and how you serve content is as fast as possible. But then at the same time, uh, the operating systems and browsers will also continually be way, way faster all the time. With offline access, and I'll get back to that a bit later about service workers and things like that. Um, with periodic background processing, uh, we're also looking now at having background sync. So just making sure the thing can actually be synced in the background and, and just run there and, and you get that done. Notifications, of course, is a really important part of this and just being able to notify the users, but at the same time only notify the users when it's something that's really relevant for them. Because if you install an app and you just keep on notifying them, it's going to be uh, just annoying and then it'll turn off all notifications. You need to be really respectful with those. And we started doing that on the web with uh, push notifications now. And sensors, it could be geolocation. We're also having web Bluetooth support coming. Uh, on desktop, we're looking at web USB. It's just different ways of just accessing all the features that you have, uh, especially in a phone uh, that you can program against. And the OS-specific features that people usually ask for, for instance, with Android, uh, it could be intents. Uh, they want some something like an intent-like experience on the web as well uh, and seeing what kind of options they have there. And the two things that we'll be talking about today uh, in later talks in the web session is offline access, service worker and, and, and the entire things that you can do with that, but also talking about notifications, uh, how you do notifications, when you do notifications, and, and I would say that the when is, is even more important. How is always something that you can learn but when it's really just figuring out how you, again, bring that extra value to users. And all of those things lead us to progressive web apps, which has become this sort of collective term for making the web better. If we're looking at the, the progressive web experience, we have three main keywords for that. Uh, one is to make sure that it's reliable for the users, that they can always make sure that they will get content and they, they can access content that is fast, it's a nice, smooth, instant experience, but also once it has loaded that you actually have some smooth scrolling instead of things just jumping around all over the page. And the last part, of course, that it's engaging, just finding ways of keeping that engagement with users. And we're back looking at, at the high engagement of native apps and seeing how the web can meet that and how we can make the web more engaging for users as well over time and not only the, the shorter experiences. And what's going to be talked about later is also about service workers. Uh, but if you haven't heard about it and haven't heard much about it, basically they're a client-side proxy in JavaScript. Um, so you can intercept a net request, uh, but that's only one way of handling it. You can also use it for other features as um, push notifications and, and syncing things in the background. So it, it, it's extremely powerful. And generally, Coming back to the, the experience part here um, and, and performance, something that we recommend when you're building websites for mobile is using a so-called application shell approach, which basically means that for every page that you go to uh, or every view within your app, there's a lot of content that's going to be the same. So the idea with this is that you have the application shell, so it could be the header of your page or the menu or something like that that's always the same. Just make sure that you only load at once and then you keep that on a device. Uh, so for each load after that, you only load the actual <coughs> content. It, it could be the, the content within the article or content within the page or something like that. But basically, only load what's necessary. Uh, because from a web perspective, if we're looking at competing uh, with Apple News and, and Facebook's instant articles, uh, the web has to be as fast, it has to be instant. You don't want the web to be equal to, you know, slightly slower or a white background or something like that. It has to be the right away for them. And when you're building apps now, uh, one of the parts of, of this sort of progressive web apps umbrella uh, is having web app manifest. You can have different meta tags, for instance, for defining theme color. So if you have a website, and in Chrome and Android, you can make sure that instead of having a, a gray top around the URL bar, you can have a color that matches your brand or, or matches your, your site colors. 
But the other, the second line here is the important thing. It's just linking to a very simple manifest file. Um, so you link to this JSON file, and within that JSON file, you describe your web app. So basically, you have a short name for a web app. You have um, a longer name, if you will, if you don't want it to be the same. But also, when people load your web app, you can just point them directly to a certain start point within your app, so they don't have to go through and navigate the same thing over and over. So you can, for instance, say that instead of going to root, you always start in the product page or something like that. And what kind of display you want to have, and the orientation part, of course, is that when people load your web app, you want to make sure that either you want it in portrait, or let's say you're building a game, for instance, it's usually a landscape approach just making sure how it loads from the get-go. And then having different icons for different resolutions and different screens and different operating systems as well. And on top of that, uh, and one of the most common things that users have been asking for is, is having a good add to home screen feature, which is sort of like a, a fancy bookmark more or less. Like you get these nice icons that you have for your web app and you get them on your home screen. Uh, and one way in, in Chrome on Android, in, in the menu, you can go in the website or have the support, you can tap Add to Home Screen. But it's not always that people go into menus and try to, to find all the features or settings. So another thing that we have started experimenting with is having this kind of automatic Add to Home Screen feature when you visit a website. So the way it works right now uh, for a website that has set up a manifest and all the things necessary for being able to be added to a home screen, is that if you visit a website two times uh, with at least five minutes apart between those visits, within Chrome we pop this thing up where we ask the user, do you want to add this to your home screen? Basically, you seem to like this page, you seem to go here uh, more than once, um, you might want to have this icon or, or this shortcut of using that. And then it's going to be covered way more in detail later, uh, it's just making sure that we're having notifications from the web as well. So for instance, if you try and use um, Facebook uh, in your web browser uh, on mobile, so right now, uh, Facebook has web push notifications, both on desktop and on mobile. And, and it's just getting the, the exact same experience that you would get from a native app, that from within a web app, you can push things. It doesn't mean that the web browser window has to be active or the phone has to be unlocked or something like that. It's just the same thing. You get the normal, regular push notifications that you expect. And it's, it's kind of a quick overview, but just talking about progressive web apps, and there's no specific list of saying, these are all the right things, and if you don't have all of them, it's not the progressive web app. It's more of a term of talking about, again, and I was talking about Ajax before, collecting a number of different technologies and approaches into one better, greater user experience uh, at the end. So usually the things that we see at this that we think that service workers, we use them for a lot of things with offline and push and things like that. We have the manifest file to describe your content. We definitely recommend the app shell caching approach uh, within your app. But also other things that you can have a splash screen, you want to have a smooth navigation. And <coughs> also the sort of progressive enhancement, so not using only the latest, but making sure that it works for every web browser. And then other things like push. Maybe push notifications isn't the most best thing for your app, but, but if it brings extra value or, or could bring in more customers or more engagement, by all means, you should definitely go for it. But a really, really important thing to stress here as well is talking about that uh, progressive web apps uh, works across all browsers. It's not just, oh, this is a thing that only works in the latest Chrome on Android N, right? So it's more of the, the mindset of building something progressively. So you build something, you build a basic foundation that works for everyone, um, and then you make sure that uh, it also works uh, in all browsers. Um, but then you can add the extra features, um, like service workers or push or something like that, in the browsers that support that. Uh, so basically progressively making it good for everyone and then make it even better where it's supported. I'm going to do a quick uh, run through. I'm actually speaking a bit too slow here. Uh, <coughs> a quick run through on, <coughs> sorry, on security here. Um, and it's basically a number of these new features require HTTPS. Um, and HTTPS is one of these important things. And, and looking at slides, it's just making sure that the web is secure for users. 
And it's, it's one thing <coughs> for users to feel secure when they use your service, but another one also for you as a site owner of knowing, like, does anyone else intercept your traffic or actually inject things within your site? And one way of stopping that is making sure that you have HTTPS. And if you look at uh, the features I was talking about before, a number of them, like uh, service workers with push, background sync, et cetera, will require HTTPS. Uh, but it also features like adding to home screen or, or using HTTP2 to the fullest or getting the um, uh, broadly compression to make things even faster. Geolocation now requires HTTPS and so on. So a number of things will demand HTTPS. Um, so I, I really recommend adding it to your own website. Um, I did it just a few weeks ago to my own website. I'm not a server guy, I'm not the security guy, but it's just more of, um, and I'm trying to say this in a humble way, how hard could it be? Uh, of course it's hard, uh, but it doesn't have to be that hard. There, there are different levels of uh, complications that you can go through. Uh, and it is a special feeling when you get that sort of green lock at the top of your own website. It, it's sort of an indication that, shit, I might actually know what I'm doing. Uh, you know it's not true, but you're sort of faking it for yourself. Um, so I would recommend looking at the Let's Encrypt service, which, can, uh, which offers you free SSL certificates for your own website. Um, and you can also generate them directly from a service called SSL for free. And there are also a number of different options out there that you can see that with GitHub static pages and uh, through Firebase and through Google Platform as well, you can get the HTTPS support. Um, and I know when it comes to um, other providers that uh, I haven't used myself, but I have colleagues recommend Cloudflare as well. And then you have different config generators. It basically depends on how deep you want to go uh, with running your own server or having control if you have other people that you that's doing this for you. Uh, but SSL Labs is also a good way of just looking at how secure is your website actually? What are different things? What kind of protocols and things could be better? And a normal question about this is about, so how do I test this locally? Is this gonna be a, a big pain? And basically, um, localhost <coughs> is treated as secure. So you can just keep on testing things and run them uh, without an issue, you don't have to get everything set up locally. Uh, you can just try it out and then make sure that it's deployed to proper HTTPS when it goes public. <coughs> and within DevTools as well, in Chrome, we've added a security panel uh, where you can go and you can see the, the security and the safety of the website that you're looking at. And uh, I do recommend looking into uh, these two links of having the, and we'll share all the slides later, but the different security docs around getting things done, uh, but also a video with a talk with one of the Chrome security engineers just talking about things to think about for making things secure. And with use cases, th there's a service in India called uh, Flipkart, and they had a native app and they decided to build a progressive web app to see what kind of results they would get. And you know, faster, less steps to, to run it, more engaging. Uh, and what they saw is oh, really, really impressive numbers. So people started to spend three times more time on their website when they had the progressive web app. Um, they also had, which I think is fantastic, a 40% return of visitors, uh, which is really, really good. And it's also, I know we're in South Korea, I know you seem to have a really good connection here. Uh, India, slightly below South Korean standard. So, uh, but it's a lot of people in India. Uh, so I think it's really the important thing with this as well, it's not just, you know, progressive web apps only works on high-end phones in, in countries with excellent connections. It works everywhere and it's a good approach of just making sure that things are really fast no matter where you build it. One thing I want to mention quickly as well, um, and is that we have the Google Developer Experts <coughs> program, and we're having a number of Google Developer Experts that will be presenting here today as well. Um, on the website, we're having uh, Shang Rok Do, Jimmy Moon, and uh, Jia Do Koo. And with the experts, it's basically people, they aren't uh, Google employees, but we see their work and we think they're really, really valuable for the community and for sharing their knowledge. Um, and usually when we look to an expert, uh, things to see if, if we think they are an expert, it's just seeing how much they contribute to open source or, or maybe how much they help out on Stack Overflow. 
they might be conference speakers or event organizers, but basically just you know being on top of things that are happening in the web world and, and sharing knowledge and, and making things easier for, for everyone. Um, so if you believe that, that you're a great <laughs> web developer and you're not an expert yet, please come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, because it, it's really important to just make sure that we also help people in a number of different countries because we can't travel everywhere, even if we want to. Um, and we also want to help you get, get out there and, and get to meet people and, and share knowledge. So I'll end with, and we'll see if this is actually gonna work out. Um, and I'll try and be understandable. So with, with the web, what I think is wonderful with the web is that you never sort of know what to expect. So I have two daughters, uh, and a couple of years ago when my oldest daughter had a birthday, uh, they, she had a party and they had cake and all that. So we gave them these small cookies, you know, cookies that are shaped like different letters. So one cookie could be the letter M, one could be the letter P, etc. Because they had just started to learn how to read, and we thought that if we give them these cookies, they might spell a word on the table. Fantastic. So it took about 30 seconds, and this was the first word that we got <laughs> from them. Which is, of course, terrifying. Uh, and we need to talk to that girl's parents. But I think it's also wonderful, because I think it's the same thing with the web here. Like, we want to give you the tools. Whatever you come up with, like if you surprise us, that's even better. Because just take all of these tools, combine them, build something new, and, and just easily change the world. Come say hi, Mida.